All right, good afternoon, everybody. It is good to have you here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share away, get it on all the platforms that I'm supposed to. Um, so if you haven't yet, please like and share and comment and do all those things. Basically, more engagement means more people getting plugged in. So uh, please go ahead and do that if you are at all able. Also, while you're waiting, uh, you can hunt down your rosary. We'll start with the Divine Mercy Chaplet here in a second. So welcome to everybody that's plugged in, and it's good to have you. Um, right now I'm just sharing it to all the platforms that I'm supposed to be getting this on to. Um, if you haven't already, please share, like, and comment. It's always nice to know, especially early on, where everybody is from, so uh, please write in there uh, just wherever you're hailing in from. It's fun to see the real worldwide nature of this hangout. Excellent. Gillian and Michael, good to have you both from Scotland. You guys should get together, have some coffee or something, or I suppose tea, whatever it is that you do to hang out uh, in Scotland. Excellent. Okay, if you haven't already, um, please uh, grab your rosary as well. Uh, we're going to get started with the Divine Mercy Chaplet here in one second. Good stuff. Ali, welcome. Good stuff. I can't see that flag very well. It's very small. Um, but welcome, wherever you're from. Uh, and Rose, good to have you. Eliana uh, from Florida. Welcome. And Barbara, good to have you. Oh, from Guatemala. Excellent. Good to have you. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with the Divine Mercy Chaplet. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell on the third day. He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. 
for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Jesus, I trust in you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Excellent. So, welcome to everybody who's plugged in. It's good to have you. Um, just a reminder that if you haven't already, please go ahead and share uh, and like the video. Do all of those things. That engagement just helps to get more people involved and allows us to meet, reach more people and hopefully uh, bring our Lord to them uh, in the middle of all the social media mess that is out there. Um, also, if you have any questions, go ahead and post them now. It's really nice to just have them all lined up so that whenever time, the time does come to start answering questions, I can get to yours first and we can have a good, good conversation about whatever it is that you guys want to talk about. Um, and that's, a, that's another thing. Um, you know, if you just want me to kind of uh, talk about a certain thing, you don't necessarily have it formulated into a question, that's fine. Um, basically, this is just a time for me to sit and relax with, with all of you and um, for you guys to, to have a chance just to be around a, be around a priest. It's tough to get a hold of priests. Um, and so this is the chance, um, hopefully, just to, to spend some time together. Um, and if you don't put anything, then it's just whatever happens to come out of my mind, which... <laughs> It's, it's of varying interest depending on uh, what kind of a day I'm having. So um, go ahead and uh, post, post whatever questions you've got. And also it's fun to, to see where you're from. And so if you want to post that as well, it's, it's neat to see um, the real international crew that we have plugged into this video. All right. Great. And since, I, since we started the Divine Mercy Chaplet, I can see there Peggy uh, is plugged in from Plainfield, Illinois. Welcome. Also, Joni, it's good to have you, my cousin. 
um, and Helene uh, Patino from Peru. Excellent. Welcome. It's good to have you. Um, good. So we're going to go ahead and move over to uh, a little reflection on the readings. Um, and always with these reflections, I try and talk about something that perhaps you didn't hear about in the, the Sunday homily. I try to vary it up a little bit. And so since that first reading and that gospel were so clearly about uh, forgiveness and uh, repentance and all of those things, hopefully you guys really stuck with that or the, yeah, you, you were able to, to draw a lot from that, from the Sunday homily. And I want to talk just a little bit about the second reading. Um, so the second reading is from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. And it says, brothers and sisters, none of us lives for oneself and no one dies for oneself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this is why Christ died and came to life, that he might be Lord of both the living, of the dead and the living. Um, and so this is actually connected to a very fundamental concept that we have as Christians, and it's very applicable today. So the, the application for today is that I've just kind of noticed in my interactions with people that it seems the whole world is freaking out about things that are happening in the world. Uh, so, you know, maybe people are freaking out about um, the political situation. I know in the United States right now, uh, we've got elections coming up and things are extremely polarized and people are saying all sorts of stuff. Um, and so people are getting extremely stressed out uh, about um, politics. Also in the, the Catholic Church, um, you know, there are different people who are saying a lot of different things and they're, they're speaking very boldly. Um, but uh, kind of the reactions to that, it, it's, kind of, it's caused this whole big um, fight and battle and people are just really, really upset about all these things that are happening in the church. Um, also, you know, worldwide, we've got, uh, there have been several big natural disasters that have been happening that are kind of freaking people out. Um, if you noticed, I, I don't know if you saw in the news, but the, um, the drug companies, I think it was nine major drug companies came together and signed a joint agreement saying that they would not ask for government approval of whatever drugs that they're developing to work against coronavirus, unless they were certain that they were safe uh, to use. Um, and so that also has created this whole um, kind of shake up in people's mental calendar for when they think, uh, you know, coronavirus is going to be over when the pandemic and the lockdowns and everything uh, will be over. And then also, um, you know, a, a lot of people, they're just kind of sick and tired of, of, of the whole thing. Um, also, the, the stock market has been all over the place um, in recent days. And so people are, are, are stressed about that. There are just, there are a lot of things that are stressing people out. Um, and they all, in, in my eyes, seem to be very connected to the world. They're, they're about, um, you know, well, what's going to happen um, to my life? What's going to happen to the world? What's, um, you know, how is this going to impact this thing that exists um, around me? How is this going to essentially affect the environment in which I conduct my life. And it's, it's actually not just Jesus Christ, but even before him, uh, there's a, a Greek philosopher named Socrates. Um, and so he was one of the, the early um, Greek philosophers. One of his most famous students was Plato, and then one of the famous students of Plato was Aristotle. And Aristotelian philosophy um, is what was really embraced heavily by the Catholic Church. Um, especially in the medieval period, to understand and systematize a lot of what Jesus Christ had preached in the gospel. And so Socrates is almost kind of understood as this, like, almost, almost like a father figure of Catholic philosophy. And so one of the things that Socrates taught in, um, I believe it was in the Timaeus, uh, was essentially that no evil can be done to me from outside. That if I am a a good man, if I'm a virtuous man, really the only evil that I can suffer is what is caused within me. It's, it's my own sins that are the evils done to me. Everything else, you know, it's, it's passing. You can take away my property. 
I'm gonna have to give it up eventually. You can take away my health, that's gonna go away naturally. Even the clarity of my mind, that's, that's probably gonna go before I die. Um, you know, relationships, those come and go anyways. Um, jobs, all of these things, they're, they're all passing of necessity. And so whenever somebody does something to take one of those things away from us, they're really just accelerating the inevitable. Um, and, and if we put our, our hope and our uh, life, so to speak, in those things, then uh, we're, we're living for, for vain things, for ephemeral things that are passing. But really, if, if we understand um, what goodness and evil is, uh, it, it comes down to, uh, I only can do um, evil to myself and nobody else can do that to me. And so in this uh, section in the letter to the Romans, St. Paul is actually repeating a very similar concept. He says, look, none of us lives for oneself and no one dies for oneself. Uh, you know, we're, we're not really here in the world um, for ourselves. We're here founded in Jesus Christ, that uh, the development from Socrates to to Paul is essentially that, you know what, it doesn't matter what happens in our lives if we are united to Christ, if we are living for Jesus Christ, and if we are living in Jesus Christ, then nothing evil can pass. Nothing evil, nothing bad can happen to us. There's nothing for us to fret about. And he goes on and he says, for if we live, we live for the Lord, right? Oh, great. If I'm alive, perfect. I'm living for God. I love that. And if we die, we die for the Lord. If I die, I'm dying for the Lord. Sure, that sounds good. And he continues, so then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. It's, you know, a true Christian has this fundamental understanding that I am utterly Jesus Christ's. There needs to be this, this redefining of our identity that there is nothing left in me except for Jesus Christ. Like St. Paul says in the letter to the Galatians, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Uh, that, that really I've, I've, I've died with Christ in baptism and I've risen with him to a new life. And that really needs to be our life, that, that we see all of reality in the light of um, our life in Jesus Christ. And when we look at the saints, these people of great faith uh, that, that really changed the world and that, that uh, saved souls left and right, they're the people who, who lived completely for Christ um, and who saw themselves only as alive in Christ. And so that's, that's really what it is that we should be living. Um, and, and there shouldn't be any stress about that. And St. Paul explains this. He says, for this is why Christ died and came to life that he might be Lord of both the living and the dead, that both in, in goodness and in evil, uh, Jesus Christ is present, no matter what we're suffering, suffering, whether goodness or evil, in life and in death, Jesus Christ is present. Um, in, in suffering and in pleasure, Jesus Christ is present, assuming it's not sinful. Um, that that if, if we really are living for Christ, then it doesn't matter what happens. The, the, the world literally can go up in flames and we're happy enough because we still possess Christ. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a, that's just a good reflection for us to all to have and a good thing to keep in mind because, um, it's easy to get caught up in the, um, in the, the emotional spin up of everything that's happening in the news, no matter basically what part of the news you look at right now. Um, they're just trying to, to really control our emotions, get us all riled up about, um, whatever it is that they're talking about, and that destroys the peace um, and the real faith in Jesus Christ that we should have as Christians. Great. All right. So, if you've uh, got any questions or even just something that you want to talk a little bit about, let me know. Um, post it in those comments. I uh, love being able to, to talk into things that you guys are interested in. Um, and so, please... Yeah, just just start putting putting stuff in there, and, and we can start talking about it. Um, I'm gonna look through the comments real quick. Eileen, hi, Father, listening for, in from the west of Scotland. I love that uh, there's so many Scottish people plugged in. I, I, we as Americans have this almost um, 
mythical view of Scotland. You know, this is the, 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 this place of, 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 of giants and epics and all of these things. So it'd be great to, to hang out at some point um, and just get to know you guys and um, have, a, have a real experience of, of some Scottish people. Um, I'm sure you won't disappoint, right? You guys all wear quilts all day long and are uh, the size of giants and you throw logs for fun. <laughs> All right, uh, and hello from Poland. It's good to have you. Excellent. And Thomas says, uh, if we live, we live for the Lord. So positive. That's right. Uh, even in prospect of death, amazing. It absolutely is. It's, it's beautiful um, to, really, to really live fully the faith that we believe. Thomas says, I understand how not to get uh, wrapped up in the news and politics. Absolutely. Um, you know, there, what's advice in, in taking action? Um, yeah, so in regard to uh, Thomas's question there, um, so there's first off, how we take action of, of not getting wrapped up in the emotional um, yeah, mess that, that so much of the news really just tries to draw us into. Um, and then there's, okay, when we see these evil things, we as Christians should desire justice and, and charity. And so how do we take action in regard to those? Um, and so in regard to, to not getting too wrapped up into things, um, you know, the, the endless scroll that social media invented is a really marvelous thing, but it's also, it's, it's an extremely dangerous thing. It's, uh, it can just suck up our, our time and our energy. Um, and I find that the majority of people that I speak to about this, they actually lose sleep over it because you just lay in bed and you scroll and you scroll and you scroll. And then, um, you know, three hours later, you realize that you've lost half of your night. Um, and so I think basically setting yourself up to not fall into the endless scroll is actually the best thing to do. Um, and to not, you know, just follow the, the continual clicking of links um, until you have a million tabs open on your computer and <laughs> you're slowly reading through all of them. Um, and so some, some really simple ways to do that are, uh, first off, to sign up for a few, a small number, when I say a few, I literally mean like three, uh, news email. Um, sources. So perhaps you can find a Catholic news source that you trust and a world news source and then a local news source. And a lot of news sources have a uh, daily or weekly email where they kind of tell you these are all the most important things that came out in this last period since our last email. Um, and so you can, you can read those things and, and be aware of it, but then be extremely disciplined with yourself that you don't keep clicking past that. Um, that, you know, basically whenever you read a news article, read it as if it's a newspaper, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you touch the newspaper, it's not going to give you another article. Um, and so, you know, read it in the same way, uh, online that, that you look at it or, you know, you listen to that one thing, but then you close it and you're done. Um, because limiting that intake is, uh, one of the most important things. Essentially, um, there's so much news out there that will click on one thing and that just kind of, um, gets you excited emotionally a little bit and then you click on the next thing and then that one revs up the emotions a little bit more and essentially as the emotions continue to get uh, built up our, our judgment our, becomes more and more clouded the emotions one of the effects of of being emotional is that it can cloud our intellect so we cannot think as clearly um, and then also the, the, our emotions can eventually overcome our will so that we actually don't choose in accord with reason but we start just choosing um, whatever it is that our emotions are driving us toward. Um, and so really staying away from allowing ourselves to kind of get on that almost escalator type uh, you know, mechanism of, of, of the news. Um, to tell you the truth, I've gone a on a few news fasts throughout my life where I just say, you know what, I'm done with the news. I don't want to read it anymore. It's, I'm done. I know the world is a bad place. There are lots of bad things happening. People need prayers. I'm just going to I'll keep praying, but I'm just going to offer them for all of the intentions of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and the news can deal with itself. Um, and 
you know, if I'm honest with myself, at the end of every single one of those fasts, I was a happier person. Um, and so I also think that unless you have a real need to be checking the news frequently, it just, just stop checking the news. It's not worth it. Um, so that's one thing you can do. In regard to uh, taking action with uh, ways to, to solve problems that you've encountered uh, through the news or social media or whatever it may be, um, the, the, there are two major principles. First off, we can only do what we can do, and God only calls us to do what we can do. And so, uh, you know, if you see that there is, um, you know, if you're from Scotland and you see that there was just a hurricane that hit Louisiana, um, you know, there's not a lot that you can do about that aside from pray. Uh, perhaps if you have some financial resources, you can send those financial resources to an organization that you trust that's working in that area. However, um, there's not a ton that can be done. Or even, you know, at this point in um, the American election, it, you know, we have Trump and Biden, and those are, those are the two people who who are going to be the main candidates. And there's not really much we can do about that. And so if you're an American citizen, you can vote um, and you know, choose the lesser of two evils. Uh, but when it comes to uh, you know, trying to change who the candidates are, like that, that, that train's already left. Um, and so uh, when you recognize that there's not actually anything you can do, uh, it's best to essentially just cut your um, connection to that. You don't need to know more information because it's it's utterly useless information. It's actually, um, it's what's referred to as vain curiosity. Um, and that's that's actually a sinful uh, thing. It's, it's, it's a vice to be, be curious about things that, that do not pertain to you. Um, but uh, to make sure that where you are capable of doing something that you go ahead and take that action. And you know, there are so many different things. Um, speaking about the individual uh, ways to take action is really difficult. So if you have something in particular that you wanted to ask about, uh, you can type that in and I'm happy to speak about that. But um, yeah, at this point, I don't want to just go into every single one of them because uh, I'm not quite sure which one you're talking about. All right, Katya sent stars. Thank you very much, Katya. I really appreciate it. Uh, hello, hello. All right, Gary Galen says, what happened this morning to the live stream of the English Mass, mass here in Neck? Yeah, you know, I, I actually uh, do not know. I've been on vacation this past week. I just got back uh, yesterday evening. And um, when, I, when I was setting everything up for this live stream, I realized that it didn't get uh, broadcast. And so I don't, I don't know what happened to it. Um, we will definitely look into that and we'll get it back up and running next week. Um, sorry, there was just a mistake. Uh, and I didn't celebrate the Mass uh, here at Sacred Heart. And so... I'm really not certain. Sorry about that, Gary. Katya says, I needed to hear this about the media and news. Good. Thanks be to God. I'm glad to hear it. Um, all right. Barbara. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry. Barbara's just commenting on the, the live stream not making it as well. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and so C. Grove says, uh, very wise words, Father George. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and Thomas says, thanks, very useful, I think, in, in regard to the, the taking action, you're welcome. Um, and Joan asks, growing up, we weren't allowed to chew communion. Now is it okay to do so? That's a really good question. Yeah, that's, that's one of those funny questions that only Catholics think about, right? Is it okay to chew Jesus? Um, so, uh, there are a lot of things that actually come into play with this. Uh, there is... Uh, first off, the question as to when is Jesus present in the Eucharist? And then also, are the external appearances, what are called the accidents or uh, the species, um, are those Jesus himself or does Jesus reside in those? So the first question is, when is Jesus actually present? Um, and so the, the Catholic Church teaches that that Jesus is present in the Eucharist um, so long as the, the, the host can be identified as bread by common human senses, right? So basically, if you can look at it and you say, yeah, that's a crumb of bread, then that is the Eucharist. 
But if you look at it and it's been so broken down that, you know, perhaps if you pulled out a microscope and you looked at it real, real, real closely, uh, you could see, you know what, there are sufficient molecules of the right things to call this bread. That's not actually the Eucharist uh, because the Eucharist was given to human beings. And so God provided us uh, with the necessary tools, our senses, to be able to identify where the Eucharist is. Um, you know, obviously still relying on faith, which comes through hearing. Um, and so when we've heard the words, uh, this is my body and this is the chalice of my blood spoken over the Eucharistic species, uh, we know that, okay, that's the Eucharist. Um, but in regard to those little tiny particles that you couldn't actually see with the naked human eye, um, God, God chooses essentially not to allow the, uh, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ to reside within that um, because uh, that would essentially just be impossible for us to really respect those things because we couldn't see them as human beings or we couldn't, you know, couldn't identify them as human beings. So the point is that um, when it's no longer bread, then it's not Jesus. Uh, or when it no longer looks like bread, uh, it's, it's not Jesus. Um, and so if you receive communion, but you just allow Jesus to kind of dissolve in your mouth, um, then it's, it's actually questionable as to whether or not you really received the Eucharist. Because uh, what, what entered into you fully, obviously it was in your mouth, but to, to fully enter into you, um, if it was not bread, you know, nobody would look at it and say that's bread because it, it actually dissolved in your mouth. Um, uh, you, you may not have, have actually received communion. Um, so that, that's one, and that kind of points towards it's better not to allow um, the Eucharist to simply dissolve in your mouth. However, perhaps you could uh, still swallow uh, the Eucharist in some way without actually chewing on it. Um, then the second point in regard to chewing on Jesus, is it really okay to chew Jesus? Uh, is, that, is that worthy of his dignity? Um, and so there's a really fine distinction that St. Thomas Aquinas actually speaks about that uh, he says, when we touch the Eucharist, we actually do not touch the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, which when I first read this, I have to admit, I was a little scared. I was like, whoa, Thomas, hey, you know, you need to calm down a little bit. Um, you can't say that. Um, but it's, it's a very fine distinction. So the idea is that when we, when we touch something, we touch what are philosophically called the accidents, um, the, those external appearances. Um, and, and for the medieval theologians, the accidents included the size or the, the, the space that was taken up by a thing. And so when we touch the Eucharist, we're actually touching its, its size. Um, and so when we, we touch it, we actually touch the accidents of the bread that was present before the consecration, um, but the substance, so kind of the, what's, what's, what it really is, is still the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Um, and so it's, it's kind of hard to, to wrap our minds around that, um, but that, uh, that, that's the reality. You know, God, God said so, and so it happened. That's how you know, creation happened, that's how the Eucharist happened, that's how um, even the incarnation happened. Um, and so it's, it's one of those kind of mysteries that's difficult to grasp. But the point is that when we chew the Eucharist, we're not actually chewing Jesus's body, blood, soul, and divinity. We're chewing the external appearances of the bread and wine that still remain after the consecration. Um, and so there's no real disrespect to the Eucharist um, in chewing on the Eucharist. Now, there is one last little thing, which is, you know, we shouldn't be walking away from the communion line looking like a bunch of cows, you know, just ch chomping. Um, uh, so that, you know, when we do chew uh, the, the Eucharist, we should, we should do it in a, in a proper way, in a polite way, um, because we did just receive the Lord of heaven and earth. Um, and so we should, we should go about um, consuming him fully uh, in, in a dignified way, whatever that dignified way is for the culture in which you live. Um, great question. <laughs> Yeah, and so Katya is saying, yeah, it's a it's a great question, um, but it's also a, a great question. It's it's um, yeah, it's 
good stuff. Hello, Felicia. Felicia. Uh, Car, good to have you. Um, Paige asked, did I have a good birthday? Yes, I did. Thank you. Yeah, I was on vacation. Uh, went and visited my family. It was, a, it was a good time. Nice to be away. All right. So I have hit the bottom of the questions. Please go ahead and uh, type in anything else that you'd like to talk about. Um, it's nice to, to be able to speak into whatever it is that you guys are interested in hearing about. So go ahead and do that. I'm going to grab some water right now. The video is just now catching up. There's a good, good delay. And so we'll see if I can get some, some questions to come in here. While we're waiting, it looks like Maria, Maria Ramirez is plugged in. It's good to have you. Anna Sanchez, welcome. And Connie Delaney as well. Thank you guys for connecting. All right. John says, happy birthday. Uh, thank you, John. I appreciate it. Right. While we're waiting, I had a, a really interesting question asked to me during the, it was, it was a couple weeks ago actually, and I thought, you know, this would be a good one to bring up if we run out of questions on the live stream. And that is, somebody, somebody asked me, they said, uh, you know what, Father, it seems like, just not just here in Nacogdoches, but actually in the, in, in the church, you know, across, like they said, across the world, they've really only experienced the church in East Texas. All right, yeah, um, in Texas. Uh, and they said, it seems like there's, there's just more Latin being used. And I was talking to someone and they said that that, uh, that just means that we're going backwards and it's, it's pre-Vatican Council. And so, you know, I don't, I, the person who was talking said, you know, I like Latin, but I, I don't really know how to respond to people who say those things. Um, and so uh, we had a really good conversation about that. Um, and uh, one of the, and so kind of what we talked about, her first question was, so uh, first off, is this, is this a going backwards? Is it, is it like pre-Vatican II? Um, and one really important thing to clear up about that is, is that actually in the Second Vatican Council, um, so the, the Second Vatican Council uh, happened in the middle of the 20th century, um, and it was, a, it, was, it was a time to, to reform and specifically to... Um, to engage modern man. A lot of changes that happened in the world uh, during the 19th and 20th centuries, and so it was kind of the church's time to, to huddle up and say, okay, how are we going to encounter the world in the 21st, or in the 20th and 21st centuries? Um, and one of the things was, uh, that was called for was, was a reform in the liturgy. Um, and what we experienced, or what we experience now as a reform in the liturgy is it's really quite a bit beyond what the Second Vatican Council actually asked for. So the Second Vatican Council did say that the vernacular um, should be used in the Mass, uh, specifically in things like, like the readings and some of the other prayers and things of that sort, the things that change very often. But the things that remain the same, that we repeat every single Mass, the Second Vatican Council didn't say that those should change from the Latin. Uh, they actually said that they should remain um, and that it's extremely important that we all know not just the Latin responses, but even how to sing uh, the ordinary parts of the Mass. And so those are the parts that don't change. Um, and when we talk about the ordinary sung parts of the Mass, we're normally talking about, um, so the, there's the Kyrie eleison, which actually is in Greek, but the original language. Um, and then there's the Gloria, and the, the Sanctus, and uh, the Agnus Dei are all some of the major ordinary parts of the Mass. Also, a lot of people add in, and this is technically part of it, the, the Our Father, the Pater Noster, and the Creed, the Credo. Um, and so the Second Vatican Council actually said, no, we should all know those, and we should all know how to sing those in Latin. Um, and 
so we aren't really going to like pre-Vatican II or anything of the sort. We're actually just trying to do what the church asked us to do so that we can confront uh, the 21st century well. This is something that the Catholic Church said, no, we should know these Latin responses. And so you have to say them sometimes in order to know them. And so if there is more Latin being used in uh, your parish, then that's, uh, that's kind of what's going on there. Um, and so then her next question was, okay, uh, so I understand that that's what the church asked for, but is there any real value to Latin beyond any other language? Like, is there something special about Latin, or is this just something uh, kind of that we randomly chose and decided we're going to use Latin? Um, and so uh, the, the the first um, thing to to look at is that really as a language, um, there isn't anything special about Latin. I mean, there's, I actually studied a lot of Latin. Um, uh, I've, yeah, <laughs> studied a ton of Latin, but there isn't really anything amazing about Latin. It, it's a great language, I like it. It's the, lots of good things about it. Um, but really, like, we, we could have chosen any of the other languages um, to do theology and to celebrate the Mass in. Um, so. In itself, no, there's nothing special about the Latin language. But there kind of is something special. And so, as, as many people talk about, Latin is, uh, is a, they call it a dead language. So it's a language that's not spoken really anywhere in the world. There are some little pockets of people who speak Latin, but um, it's not uh, a language that's really embraced by a certain geographical region. Uh, it's a language that, that isn't developing that much anymore. And that is important. So it is not the language of any one people. And because it's not the language of any one people, it can be embraced by the entire world. So if something isn't anywhere, that means it's everywhere. If something doesn't belong to one place in particular, then it belongs to the whole world. Uh, it's actually kind of, uh, there's a parallel in how we understand God's um, omnipresence. So God is, is present everywhere, but he's also not um, circumscribed, so he's not stuck in one place. And so because you can't point to something and say, like, that's God, or there's God, um, he is able to be present in all places. And so in the same way, the Latin language has a universality to it because it doesn't have a particularity. So it's not particular to anyone people, therefore it can be used everywhere. Um, and so for the, the Roman Catholic Church, as a Catholic Church, it's a universal church, it's everywhere, um, and it's actually meant to be embraced by everybody, uh, having this, this one language in which we can all say, yes, this is my language, because there isn't one region that says, no, this is our language. Um, that allows for a real unity um, in, in, in speech and in communication, which is such an important part of, of the human person, to be able to communicate and speak in a particular language. Um, it allows it to be embraced by the whole universal church. I feel like that was a little bit rambling, but the point is that uh, Latin, as not being spoken by any one region, is a language that, is, that can be spoken by everybody. It can be claimed by people all around the world. And that mimics how the Catholic Church, which is not just a regional church, but a church for the entire world, um, it can be embraced by all people. So that's the first one, um, that there's a kind of fittingness to the Latin language to be used by the Catholic Church, because it's a universal language. The next one is that for us specifically as Roman Catholics, uh, we should kind of love our, our Rom Romanicity. Uh, we should love the fact that we're Roman Catholics. So interestingly, m you know, most people's experience of, of being Catholic is just, well, I'm Catholic, and they don't really have an experience of any kind of Catholicism that isn't Roman Catholicism. But actually, there are, there are other Catholic churches out there, there are the, the Eastern churches, is typically how you refer to them, um, and traditions that are not Roman. So they came from other apostles. Um, and each of these churches have their own unique history. It's usually from a particular apostle. Sometimes it's a little bit more complex of a history. But they, they have a kind of a, a root from which they uh, sprung. 
um, this place that they came from, or this, this person that they came from. And we as Roman Catholics, we trace our roots back to Rome. And not just to Rome, but to Peter and Paul, because they were both uh, martyred there in the city of Rome. And so just like, you know, somebody that's from Italy that has, you know, Italian heritage, say, like, you know, they, they love the Italian culture or Irish or, um, you know, whatever it may be. Even you see this with, like certain universities like, oh, yeah, you know, here in Texas, we have we have the Aggie families like, oh, yeah, I'm from an Aggie family or in the Catholic Church in America, you see Notre Dame. Oh, yeah, you know. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm from a, a Notre Dame family or, or something of that sort. Um, we should have this, this kind of human love for, for our, our heritage. Uh, and so as Roman Catholics, we should, we should love our, our Romanitas, uh, not just because it's our heritage, but also because we really do kind of have a bragging point that, no, actually, I come from the, the church, the, the, the city, in which Peter and Paul, you know, the, the, the apostle to the Jews and the apostle to the Gentiles, the prince of the apostles, the, the, where he was martyred, where they were martyred. Um, and I'm proud of that. And I love being Roman Catholic partially because of that, because the Roman Catholic Church does have a real dignity among all of the different churches. And so I love my Roman Catholicism, my, my Roman Catholicness. Uh, and Latin was the language of the Roman Empire. And so I have a love for Latin. Why? Because it's one of these ways that we express the fact that we're part of the Roman Catholic Church, that our heritage goes all the way back to Peter and Paul, the princes of the apostles. And, and we should be really proud of that. And so we should have a love for uh, the Latin language that has, it's a very human kind of inheritance, heritage type thing, but it's still important. I mean, we're human beings. Um, so then the last one is, uh, this is actually kind of coming from the, the, the effects. So um, kind of after the fact, there's no initial principle in which, you know, we can look at the Latin language and say, you know, because of X, Y, and Z, the Latin language is, is superior and uh, it, it shouldn't be, or it, you know, it, it should be used in, in the liturgy or something of the sort. Uh, however, what we have found is that uh, the, the, essentially the devil hates Latin. <laughs> Um, you know, exorcists have found that the, the exorcism rite in, uh, in English just doesn't work as well, or in any vernacular language, doesn't work as well as the Latin exorcism rite. Also, in, in, as part of the um, rite of exorcism, or you know, part of spiritual warfare, is this ability to kind of bind uh, demons and force them to answer your questions. And they have a, it, it's been shown that they have a particular hatred for the Latin language. And it's not because Latin is holier than any other language or anything of that sort uh, in itself, but because that's the language that has been embraced by the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church has done an immense job in evangelizing a huge part of the world. And so, uh, you know, the demons hate the Roman Catholic Church because it's, it's been responsible for the salvation of so many souls. And because they hate the Roman Catholic Church, they hate Latin. Um, and so, you know, if we consider ourselves part of the church militant, the people who fight against the, the powers of Satan here in the world, well then we should love Latin and we should use it because <laughs> it just throws red hot coals on the, heads of, on the head of the devil, you know? Uh, we should kind of love that. Um, so uh, those are all the, uh, the things. And then there's, there's one last point that's connected to uh, Latin being a dead language. So, um, you know, languages, they, they kind of shuffle. Uh, and the meaning of words in a living language changes. Um, you know, the, actually, <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a college chaplain, and I spent all this time with uh, college students. And recently, they, they were telling me about how when, when something is good, you say it slaps. Um, so like, oh yeah, that, it, how was that event? Oh, it slapped. They said that, <laughs> is, that is that good or bad? Like, what does that even mean? Um, and so you know, the word slap, which you know, usually, at least for me, I think of, well, when something slaps, that means it hurts, it's bad. Uh, 
it's actually kind of shuffled its way to actually mean something good. It was cool. Um, you know, another one, uh, lit is, a, is another term that's used by young people where like, oh yeah, that was really cool. But, you know, to be lit, even just 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, meant to be under the influence of drugs. Uh, but then prior to that, to be lit meant, you know, it was just in reference to fire. And so here, probably during, you know, some people's lifetime, uh, we've had the word lit mean three different things. Uh, but that doesn't happen in a, a dead language, the dead languages that don't continue to change. And so if we want to do theology, and we want to have a theology that does not change, but it, it develops, but doesn't change, uh, then it's ideal to use a language that is not changing because those words carry meaning. And, as, and if those words begin to change in their meaning, then uh, there's a danger that the theology will change with the words. And we, we don't want that. We preserve and hand on what it was that was revealed to us uh, by Jesus Christ. And so it's important to have a not living language as the primary language in which we do theology. So those are all the reasons why we use Latin and why we embrace Latin and why we should love Latin um, as Roman Catholics. Great. Whew, excellent. Man, there are loads of good questions that just came up. I went and rambled a little bit too long about the Latin. Um, uh, Familia Lopez asks, since we are social distancing, is watching Mass every day the same as going spiritually? Um, so it depends a little bit by what you mean uh, as going spiritually. So uh, I'm going to talk about kind of three different ways to participate in Mass. There is the participating in Mass that's sometimes spoken of as like a spiritual participation in Mass, where perhaps you're at work, you can't make it to Mass, but you know at this time Mass is being offered in your parish church. And so perhaps what you could do is you set a little alarm on your clock or on your phone, and it just reminds you Mass is starting at this church, even though you can't be there. And at that time, you just you, you unite your, your day and, and the work that you're doing at that time and, and your love to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass at that time. So that's one way to kind of spiritually participate in Mass. Um, and that would be kind of like the, the lowest form of participation because we participate in the sacraments specifically through our senses, right? We have our five external senses and it's through those that we enter into those liturgical acts of worship, uh, one of those being the Mass. And so that doesn't actually involve any of our senses, but it is a kind of um, intention in our minds and our souls uh, to, to be united to the Mass. Um, then the next one is attending online. And so you can, you can watch the Mass, and obviously that engages your sight and your hearing, but it doesn't quite engage all of the senses, and you are not physically present at that Mass. And so that is a higher form than the first one, but it's, it's lower than physically being present. Um, and then physically being present, I actually just saw an article that um, uh, Cardinal Seurat, who is the prefect for the Congregation uh, for, of Worship, um, in Rome sent a letter saying basically in-person attendance at Mass should be encouraged as soon as, um, as as possible with the proper coronavirus precautions and things of the sort. So basically um, he's saying look don't let people just attend Mass digitally forever. No, th there needs to be a real um, a real pushing towards attending Mass in person because that is the highest form of participation. So I hope that uh, clarifies things a little bit there. Um, all right, John asks uh, Father Martin, Bishop Strickland, and Father Altman. <laughs> yeah, John. Whew. Um, so uh, a little bit about each of those. Um, so Father Martin is a Jesuit priest um, who is fairly outspoken in support of uh, what would broadly be considered very um, liberal uh, issues. Um, while being liberal doesn't mean being non-Catholic, what it comes down to is that Father Martin supports many 
non or yeah, many things that are contrary to the Catholic faith. Um, it's uh, seriously problematic. He, he supports divorce and remarriage. He supports uh, gay marriage. He supports um, uh, essentially uh, allowing politicians to be pro-life but to vote pro-choice. Things of that sort that are just they're clearly against um, what we believe to be good for any human being, um, not just uh, you know something that is like against the rules, but we actually believe as Catholics that living in those ways that Father Martin is supporting actually draws a person away from the happiness that they were created for uh, on this earth and ultimately in eternity and. Um, so the, the, you know, Father Martin uh, is someone that is, is very problematic. Um, obviously, there is a lot of, um, uh, yeah, a lot to be discussed within that. Um, bishop Strickland. So Bishop Strickland is uh, the bishop of the Diocese of Tyler, Texas, here, um, and he's one of the, the outspoken, real defenders of the faith um, in America and in the Catholic Church uh, across the world. Um, and he's spoken strongly. Um, against Father Martin whenever Father Martin has uh, done some of his more public um, statements about those issues. You know, Bishop Strickland sees himself as, uh, as a bishop, as responsible for the handing on of the faith, and he stands up and, and says what the truth is. Um, and, um, you know, he, he calls out the, the wolf in sheep's clothing that when, when somebody says, oh no, I'm just a faithful servant of the church and hear all these things that are contrary to church teaching, uh, you know, Bishop Strickland is not afraid to say, nope, that's a wolf, uh, stay away from him. And Father Altman, yeah, so Father Altman uh, recently, I think he's, he's most famous for a video that just came out where he, um, I actually think it's, it's somewhat sad that uh, it has been so hyper-politicized the, the vast majority of this video that he put out um, was not on this topic, but one of the things that he said was uh, essentially, um, you know, you can't be a faithful Catholic and vote Democrat. Um, and uh, Bishop Strickland um, essentially tweeted in, in support of Father Altman, and Father Altman has been um, kind of disciplined by his, uh, uh, by his own uh, bishop and lots of different things are happening right now. Um, and yeah, so uh, that's uh, that's kind of the, the situation with all of those. Basically, Bishop Strickland very strongly uh, supported Father Altman and oftentimes speaks against Father Martin. Um, what is the, the judgment on all of those things? Well, first off, I'm, I'm not really the one to, to judge. However, I think um, you know, it's certainly Bishop Strickland's duty as a, as a bishop to, to defend the faith and to clearly communicate the faith. Um, obviously, what Father Altman said puts the Catholic Church at risk in regard to um, its 501c3, um, basically the nonprofit uh, category, uh, so that donations to the Catholic Church are considered as um, you know, non, non-taxable income. Uh, However, to tell you the truth, um, you know, I'd rather be part of a poor church that is not afraid to, to speak the truth than a rich church that um, hides in the face of, of falsehood. Um, and so that's, that's where we are. All right, so Thomas, uh, could you post those parts that we should know? Um, Yes, what I'll do is uh, whenever the, the video is over, we're going to finish up here in a couple of minutes. Um, I'll, I'll respond to your, to your comment there. Thank you. All right. John says, Latin, very good now along with uh, Trinitine form and Gregorian chants. Most excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome, John. Thank you. Um, all right. It's beautiful to know, says Thomas. Barbara says, I like the viewpoint that since Latin is universal, uh, it's, since it's not spoken in, in one region, yeah, um, I think that's something that's uh, really important uh, and, you know, we just don't hear a lot about. All right, and Rebecca asks, uh, not a big doctrinal question, but this really annoyed me. I've been living with my in-laws for a year now 
and I couldn't just stand my father-in-law's bad habit for making the washroom dirty or leaving his dishes for us uh, for granted and many other things. Um, I don't like cleaning up his mess, but I want the house to be clean, so I still did. This is one daily example. The question is how to determine whether I should voice, uh, should speak out, or um, see the thing I don't want to do as penance and take it. Yeah, so there are, um, there are a lot of good uh, <laughs> uh, kind of the, kind of two sides to that. Um, Shucks, I just saw the time we need to wrap up. Uh, but um, it, it does say very clearly in the scriptures that um, you know, if a brother sins against you, tell him his fault. And so um, it's, it's good and it's important to communicate uh, with the other people, especially when we're living with them. Um, hey, you know what? You, you're doing this and it, at least I am, I'm receiving it as you taking advantage of me. Um, and, you know, try and word it better than that, but, uh, you know, making sure that you communicate that well. Um, and then if they still choose not to change, or they just kind of blow you off, um, you can actually look at, uh, I believe it was last Sunday's gospel that talks about the fraternal correction and how to kind of go about that. Um, but also, you know, anytime we do suffer anything, just take that as a penance, um, you know, and, and offer it up uh, for, for the salvation of souls and the glory of God. Um, all right, Alfredo. Uh, Pexin, I'm sorry, it's four o'clock, but uh, I'm not selective with questions sent. If I did skip it or ignore it, I apologize. I didn't mean to at all. Um, and so uh, please go ahead and post those again next week, and um, I'm happy to, to answer any of those. I'm an open book. Um, so let's finish with a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless. Thanks so much, y'all.